Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight, as Darren said, to study the Word of God and to learn about marriage, to continue our discussion on marriage. So doing a little bit of a review from last time, we were talking about the marriage covenant. We talked about what is a covenant, what makes up a covenant, and specifically, what is the one flesh covenant. We might touch on some sensitive topics today, but I am going to try my best to keep it PG, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but, you know, in any discussion of marriage, some things are bound to uh, touch on sensitive issues. Uh, so in Malachi 2.14, we had seen this amazing verse that tells us a lot about the covenant of marriage, the one flesh covenant between a man and a woman. It says here, the Lord is witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless. At the time when Malachi is writing this, they were not taking the one flesh covenant too seriously. So God had to rebuke them and remind them that he was the primary witness of the covenant. But here we can understand that we're pledged to one mate, and we are to keep this pledge very, very holy. As we discussed at the parts of the covenant, the consummation of this pledge is the sexual union between the man and the woman. And for obvious reasons, uh, this could also be considered a covenant ratified by the spilling of blood, as many covenants were in the Old Testament. Um, so we could call the one flesh covenant a type of blood covenant. And it was really a shadow, wasn't it? A shadow of the come ultimate covenant in Christ. That's what it points to, because we are pledged to one husband, Jesus Christ, as 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says. Uh, so this is our motivation, being pledged to Jesus. We get engaged, if you will, when we become baptized. Some people say, oh, we married Christ when we got baptized. Well, the wedding is coming. The wedding hasn't come yet. The union hasn't been completely consummated yet. Uh, so we're in this betrothal period when we get baptized. And so we're keeping ourselves pure. The church is that pure virgin that's waiting for her husband to come back to the ultimate wedding of all, all times. Uh, and so we are to be that 3A bride, the bride of Jesus' covenant. We are to be attractive to Jesus. We're to adapt to Jesus. And we're to appease, to please Jesus in everything. Uh, Jesus has made us holy. He has cleansed us with the washing uh, with water. That's baptism through the word. Jesus wants to present us to himself as this radiant church. And that's what we are. You know, if he makes us radiant, <laughs> that's exactly what we are. And this is an amazing thing, despite still living in the flesh, despite being in the sinful flesh, we have, we're covered by the blood of Christ. And that makes us a radiant bride. And that's how we need to continue to keep that attractiveness, is to stay away from sin and to adapt to Christ. We need to put all our energy, emphasize every area of our life to adapt to Jesus. That's how we keep ourselves pure. That's what God predestined us to do, to be conformed to the image of his son. Just like a wife, a pleasing wife, adapts to her husband, conforms to him. So we as the church adapt to Christ. And finally, we are to please and praise and glorify Jesus. We appease him, as Peter says here. You know, we declare the praises of Christ uh, in every area of our life. And if we are conforming to Christ, if we are 
being that bride, uh, waking up every day uh, in full view of Christ, understanding that and making everything about him, we are appeasing him. We are praising him in everything that we do in great expectation of that pledge that's going to be consummated when Jesus comes back. And so, as Romans 6, 3 through 8, this pledge was enacted by our union to Christ, to Christ's blood, when we were baptized. Uh, as it says here in verse 5, if we have been united to him, notice how many times in this verse we emphasize unity. We're baptized into his death. We're united with him in a death like his. We're united with him in a resurrection like his. We died with him. Now we will live with him. So everything is about Christ, about him, around him, in him. He is our everything. He is our all, just like we sing. So we continue on with this idea that marriage is a natural law. What do I mean by that? Well, it works automatically <laughs> without regard to sin or righteousness. It's like gravity. Gravity works on everybody. You don't have to be a Christian in order to believe gravity works. It's a natural law. There are many such laws. Some are scientific. Some have been defined by science. Some have been defined by economics. Uh, law of supply and demand. It's just you know, unwritten rules that we discover that are occurring in nature. Some are spiritual laws, uh, like uh, you reap what you sow, right? And so marriage is one of these laws that it, we call it natural because it's of the flesh. It's of nature. It works in nature. It's a universal phenomenon. No matter what culture, what country, what peoples you go to, whether they believe in God or not, whether they are Christian or not, whether they are, whether they are moral or not, people practice marriage. It's a universal phenomenon. Men and women were designed to be married, to procreate as a family unit. A man and a woman are married whenever they enter into a sexual union by mutual consent and commitment as husband and wife. Whether they have experienced previous, previous marriages or not, doesn't matter. This is what makes a marriage as far as the natural law is concerned. And that's one thing that almost every culture and every peoples on the earth can agree to do. It's something that has to be voluntary by mutual consent and a commitment to a pledge. However, for us Christians, as, as I've repeated time and time again through the study, in Christ we can understand much better the beautiful plan God has for those who are married. It is to point us in a specific direction, and we as Christians are in the best position to be blessed by marriage because they under, we understand the power and the purpose of it. So we understand better than anyone what is a marriage, when is a marriage, which is what we're going to discuss next. So how and when does God join two people to become one flesh? What is that? When does that happen? How does that happen? Well, it's a mystery in part, but... Sometimes it's not such a mystery. Uh, as we read from Malachi 2.14, uh, marriage was recognized and honored as the covenant that it is to be, as we read here, your wife by covenant, by marriage covenant. If there was uh, a sexual relationship like we had discussed before that happened without a formal covenant, it could be considered a marriage, as we read here in Exodus, when somebody was seduced and they, uh, you know, became intimate, but that was not their intention. Uh, what do we do? Well, they had to pay the bride price anyway. If the father refused to give her in marriage. The man had to pay the bride price regardless. So sometimes this happened. But as we read here, uh, God is the one who is witness in the marriage covenant. And so he knows what's going on in the heart of two people who are pledging to be married. This is in the Old Testament, how people viewed it. And they understood that God was there as the primary witness in their marriage. Now, in the New Testament, we understand much, much deeper what marriage is meant to be. We understand that there is 
uh, not just a physical intimacy, like everybody understood in the Old Testament, mainly for procreation, but that there's more to it. There's more to the bond of marriage than just a sexual bond. It is something very, very intimate, as we read even in Ephesians 5, 25 and following. It's about loving one another. It's really the place where we get to practice that all the kinds of love in our family. Agape love, philos love, familial love, affectionate love, and passionate love. It's where we get put into practice all these different kinds of love. And being that marriage is the shadow of Jesus' marriage to the church, we in the New Covenant now have a better understanding of what the New Testament teaches concerning marriage, even though God had established marriage even before the Old Covenant. So it was an institution of old, one of the very first ones, right? Jesus kept telling the Pharisees, it was not like this in the beginning. Since the beginning, he always takes us back to Adam and Eve when he talks about what is a marriage and what a marriage is defined by, that one flesh covenant. So even before the Old Testament was instituted, marriage was already there. People got married and were given in marriage, as Jesus says here. In the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and given in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. They were practicing this. It was a common law. It was a natural law that people did regardless of their beliefs. Uh, sometimes in the Old Testament, we see some people practicing things in their marriage that bring a lot of question marks. What is this business about having many different wives, as we see with David and Solomon? Or even what Abraham and Sarah did, you know, that could be considered adultery. So sometimes we're like, whoa, what happened here, <laughs> you know? So we can't use those examples to say, well, they did it, and they were people of God, so maybe that's how we do it too. No, we cannot use that as an excuse, because now... In the New Testament, we understand the purpose of marriage. Uh, Jesus reminds us of the one flesh covenant, as he told here the Jews that were trying to find the loophole of divorce, trying to justify the loophole of divorce that uh, Moses had written into the law of Moses. Jesus says to them, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. So Jesus is always taking us back. Look, this is how it's always been. Just because David and Solomon and many others did what they did, that didn't give any justification for divorce or for you to have multiple wives. Since the beginning, it has been male and female. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, singular, one wife. And the two, two, no more than two, no less than no more than uh, no less than one uh, they become one flesh and so jesus redefines that makes it clear to us so that now we understand this vow that we make this engagement that we make is really a shadow of the baptism that we have in christ and that through baptism we enter into this betrothal with jesus and so by a covenant a couple enters into their wedded bliss. A man and a woman are therefore married whenever they enter into a sexual union by mutual consent and commitment as a husband and wife in the manner of a covenant. That's what we can kind of distill the when and the how of the marriage as concise as possible. Uh, so what are the terms of this marriage covenant? Let's talk about that for a little bit. You know, we like to read the fine print whenever we're signing a contract. So what is this covenant about? A lot is said in bits and pieces throughout the Old and the New Testament, but we're going to focus more on the New Testament and how, it's, and how marriage is presented to us in the New Testament. So we read here, Paul takes this statement from the law of Moses. So a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. So in this one sentence, we can learn a lot about the expectations of marriage. Even though Paul is deriving this from the law, it is still true today. It is still true in the New Testament. Marriage binds for life. What God joins, let no man separate. The only thing that should separate somebody in a marriage covenant, is death. 
If somebody dies in the marriage covenant, then the other person is free to marry anyone they choose. But here the direction, now in the new covenant, right, is they must belong to the Lord. They should marry a Christian man. If, it, it was, if it's a, a widow, uh, a woman who's been widowed, or a Christian woman, if it's the man who has been widowed. So marriage is only something for this life on earth. Once somebody dies, that's it. They're released from the covenant of marriage. In heaven, at the resurrection, Jesus says, when we're all raised from the dead, uh, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels. The angels don't get married. They don't have to worry about that. They don't, they don't have that concern. <laughs> They're free from that concern. So uh, in heaven, there is no marriage. And you know, this is a very telling statement, right? This could only come by revelation of God. Because, uh, you know, people who didn't believe in God, who were polytheists, they always had their gods marry or, or have fleshly interests, just like people, because the imagination of man cannot imagine something that they don't know. So somebody who didn't know God imagined their gods to also have interest in marriage and being married. Only from the truth, only from Christ could have given us this true revelation about how things are in heaven. He said, no, that's not how it's going to be. In heaven, nobody is going to get married. We will be like the angels. That doesn't mean we're going to be angels, but we're going to be like them, being spiritual beings with no need for marriage. So that and that's pretty obvious, right? I mean, it's the one flesh covenant. Flesh being a primary word there. When you're spirit, you're not flesh. So no one flesh covenant is needed at that point. At that point, uh, in heaven, we're going to have a different kind of marriage. And it's not going to be a one flesh covenant. We're going to be married to Jesus. Here in Revelation, we take a peek of that day to come. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. That's the church. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And he says that that fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So when you do good deeds, and when you devote yourself to doing good works, you're putting on that fine linen garment. You're getting ready as a bride, beautifully dressed to meet her husband. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. So in heaven, there will be a wedding. As a matter of fact, that might be one of the first activities that occurs after Jesus raises, up, raises us up from the dead, after he comes back. Here in Revelation 21, 2, we also take a peek at the, at the holy city, the new Jerusalem. This is the church. Right? This is us coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. That's why the bride on their wedding day puts on her best garments. The groom is also dressed because it's going to be a glorious day. And probably they take it uh, as a word picture from what we're being presented here in Revelation. And Lots of parables throughout the New Testament are always speaking about this, are always telling us about uh, this marriage of the bride and the groom, marriage between Jesus and the church in one way or another. For example, here in Matthew 9, 15, Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? He's talking about the guests, his disciples, he is the bridegroom. The time will come when the bride, bridegroom will be taken away. He's talking about himself. He's the bridegroom. Then they will fast. In Matthew 22, verse 2 and following, this is the parable of the kings who gave a wedding feast. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Who's the king? The father. Who's the son? Jesus Christ. You know, he... The father is pleased to marry off his son, Jesus, to the church. What a great privilege. What a great honor. What great joy awaits for us uh, when that comes, when that time comes. Matthew 25, one and following, the parable of the ten virgins. Another parable. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like, and remember, he talks about the kingdom of heaven. That means the church. 
not just the local church, not just the universal church, but he's also referring of what the kingdom will be uh, when Jesus comes back. It will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. All these parables concerning the kingdom of heaven, the setting of them is a wedding. It's a wedding banquet. It's a wedding feast. All of it alluding and pointing to the marriage of, the, of Jesus and the church. Uh, Luke 12, verse 36, he encourages disciples, be ready, be dressed, ready for service, right? The good works, the, the fine linen. Keep your lamps burning. The lamps of the uh, ten virgins, how five of them, you know, let the fire go out. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Uh, in Luke 14, 8, he also talks about when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more important is invited. So in all these parables allude to this wedding feast. In John 3, 29, Jesus speaks as the bridegroom again. He says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The church belongs to me, Jesus says. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. Who's he talking about here? Well, the friend that he's alluding to here is John the baptizer, you know, because uh, John in this passage is kind of presenting Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus talks about, yes, my joy is complete. Now it's my time, you know, to get, get this bride ready for me. And so he sees himself as that bridegroom. In these verses, Paul explains something very beautiful here that gives us some depth of insight into God's plan, into the gospel, even into the changing of the testaments and why that had to happen. A very revealing verse of the heart of God. Paul says, for example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, as we read before. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's released from that law. And it's not an adulteress if she marries another man. So my brothers and sisters, he's, he's building a foundation here, right? He's telling us some truths about marriage and how God sees it. Uh, it's a lifelong covenant, and it should not be adulterated by committing sexual immorality. Uh, only uh, done for marriage is only releases you when there has been a death. What does he mean by all this? Well, in verse 4, he says, Brothers and sisters, you died to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. So this is a beautiful verse because it indicates that God released Israel from their covenant, not by divorcing, although God threatened many times to divorce Israel because of her adultery. He had every right to. He was justified to do that. Uh, but he didn't. He did the right thing. You know how he released Israel? By dying to the covenant. Because death is what releases you from the covenant. So instead of divorcing Israel and leaving her without hope, he died. He died to the covenant, releasing Israel so that now Israel could be joined to Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing? That shows the heart of God, that he'd rather die than to leave Israel without hope in this world. That shows the heart of God. And that even though he was justified to divorce, he didn't do it. He'd rather die to release not only Israel, but us from that binding law so that now we are free, free to be joined to Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing. That cannot come from the mind of man. <laughs> this is definitely the revelation of God, the Spirit of God. No man would ever have thought of a plan like this. No way, Jose. Too complicated, too deep. But it shows us the heart 
of God. And so now when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin. So brothers and sisters, when we're taught the word of God, when we're admonished, when, when you're being preached that, <laughs> when we're here learning the word of God, all of these things are done so that we might be presented as the pure virgin, so that we don't go after the things of the world, so that we're kept away from the deceitfulness of sin that hardens the heart so that we can be kept pure for the time when Jesus comes back so that he won't reject us, but that he may take us up as his bride. That's who we're promised to, brothers and sisters. So what did we learn here? Well, a marriage then, we saw what brings together a marriage. Well, can something take a marriage apart? Absolutely. There are four things we see in the Bible that can dissolve this covenant, right? First one is obvious, death. Death, as we read in Romans 7, 2. And by the way, that's the only acceptable one in God's eyes. In God's eyes, that's the only way to get out of a marriage covenant, free and clear, guilt-free, no bad things happening. Uh, that's the only one, brothers and sisters, I got to be honest with you. The other ones listed here happen because of sin. Adultery, as Jesus said in Matthew 19.9. Yes, Matthew 19.9. Well, here's Romans 7.2. We had already read it. Uh, Matthew 19.9. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So adultery, you commit adultery in a marriage, you know, you are, you are in line to destroying or dissolving that marriage covenant. And uh, if you divorce, the same thing. So they're kind of uh, vice versa, right? You divorce with no justification you're making your spouse commit adultery. So either way you look at it, it's not a good situation, except for sexual immorality. And we're going to talk more about that later, what that means. But either way, you know, it's a mess. It becomes messy. And it's not really what God intended. It happens by sin. Uh, and then the last one is desertion. You know, if you get deserted, as we read before in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, if, if you're married to somebody who is not a Christian, and that person leaves you high and dry, you know, you never hear from them again, they abandon you, then that brother or sister is not bound, not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So there you have it. Those are the only ones that the Bible says can dissolve this marital covenant. But I do want to point out that these last three, these last three, is not what God intended. God says, what God joins, let no man separate. And I want you to understand that two, three, and four on this list, man separates. So it's not that it can't happen. It can't happen. But man is doing it. It's not God's intention. And we have to be very careful. It's not what God wants. Nevertheless, God does recognize some of these things as deal breakers. And he points them out in his word for us to understand it. And more so for us to understand them in the spiritual sense as well. And we'll get a little bit more into that uh, in the coming classes. So let's do a little bit of review here. Who makes a marriage? Who makes a marriage? Well, Genesis 2.24, a man and a woman. That's who makes a marriage. Two men don't make a marriage. Two women don't make a marriage. Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 is very clear about that. It's an abomination. A marriage is always more than one person, no more than two, man and a woman. Okay? And I do want to say, as Jesus said here, that marriage is not for everyone. Not everyone is intended to be married. Jesus specified that here in Matthew 19, where he talks about a great deal 
Well, not a great deal. He just mentions a few things that some have <laughs> made a big mess out of, as they do other things in the Bible. Really quite simple, and we will examine them carefully. But in this part of Matthew 19, he's just saying, look, not everyone can accept this word, but only to those who it has been given. Why, why is he saying this? Because the disciples were saying, what? We got to be married until death do us part? Is that for real? <laughs> I thought there was a loophole there, you know, the, the loophole of divorce. What happened to it? And we're going to see that Jesus explains there never was a loophole for divorce, okay? Moses gave you that law about divorcing because your hearts were hard, not because it was something God wanted to do. So, yeah, this is marriage. Deal with it. And they were like, ah, who was then to get married? You know, they started to talk about it. No one should get married then. And Jesus says, you're right. No one, not everyone should. Not everyone can accept this lifelong covenant. And we see that in our society, don't we? We see what mess our society has made about marriage. Even in the church, how divorce just gets in there, how sin gets in there and destroys families. Then he goes on in verse 12 to say, there are eunuchs who were born that way. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven the one who can accept this should accept this so what is what does all this mean this mystery of the eunuchs well jesus is saying here look marriage is not for everyone because you have to accept you have to be okay with the kind of commitment involved in this marriage covenant you have to accept this contract if you want to be benefited by it, if you want to be blessed by it. If not, you might as well going to be cursed by it, right? Like any of the other covenants that God made, when we obey the wording of the covenant, we're blessed. When we don't, we find some curses, and that's just the way it works, right? So eunuchs from birth. What does that mean, eunuchs from birth? Well, that may be people who are born with very low libido, they don't really care one way or another about members of the opposite sex. Marriage is not something attractive to them. You know, they'd rather be alone. And that's not bad. That's okay. That's a good thing, actually. Paul says, I wish you were all like me. <laughs> don't get married. Because it can be very distracting. It can be very burdensome. It has its purpose, but it also has its huge responsibilities. So some people, Jesus says, they're born eunuchs. They're born this way. They just don't really care. They have low libido, low sexual urges. It doesn't really matter to them. They definitely shouldn't get married. Okay. Then he talks about eunuchs who were made eunuchs by others. Now, we pray to God that that may not be happening in today's uh, day because nobody should experience being made a eunuch. This is something that happened way back when, something that was typically done to slaves uh, in ancient times to protect the harem of the king. So uh, that involved doing a medical procedure that left the man with very low libido, low or left them impotent. And this, by the way, can also occur with women. Not uh, becoming a eunuch, but women can also be born with no desire to be married, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. And then lastly, we have those who choose to live like eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. Like Paul. Paul described himself that way. And he called it a gift. We oftentimes make a reference to the gift. Do you have the gift? I don't have a gift. I definitely don't have it. Do you have the gift? And uh, what's the gift? The gift is low libido, uh, no desires, born a eunuch. So that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But if not, then if you don't fit any of these and you want to get married, make sure you understand the commitment and make sure you can accept it. Otherwise, man, you're just going to bring upon yourself a whole lot of things that you would have rather not do. So in the New Testament, marriage is always compared. Just to kind of close up our thoughts for today's class. In the New Testament, marriage is always compared and contrasted to the relationship between Jesus and the church. 
And this passage here uh, is very telling. Five, Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. There again, Paul repeats the one flesh covenant. Then he says this phrase, he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Marriage can be explained in a few words, as I've tried to tell you today, but it's still a profound mystery. There are still profound implications, lessons, profound allegories and metaphors and comparisons and contrasts that a married person will be blessed to live and understand and suffer that all point to that great awesome day when we're going to have our wedding with Jesus Christ. Eventually everyone, everyone in the kingdom that is, will be married and will be married to Christ. So marriage is a living workshop unto perfection. It's the ultimate form of discipleship. And the trials and the challenges of marriage and subsequent parenting deepen our understanding of God's heart as to how he relates to us. And these challenges are not necessary for everybody, okay? You don't have to go through them. <laughs> Thankfully, you don't have to be married to be a Christian and to be a fruitful person in the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, this is what Paul has to say. He says, look, I want you to be free of concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. That's where distraction comes in. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, Paul says, not to restrict you, because Paul couldn't command people not to be married. That's their choice. But he wants us to live in a right way. And the right way, whether you're married or single, is to live in undivided devotion to the Lord. And if you decide to get married, if you decide to do this marriage thing, <laughs> let that marriage be okay with that marriage preparing you for the ultimate marriage to your husband, Jesus. And it's going to be a lifelong thing. Be ready for that. So if you got any questions concerning today's class, you know my number. And we got three questions for discussion today. How does marriage point to our union to Christ? Gee, I, I left you many ideas on that. I'm sure you can discuss it. How has Jesus' teachings improved our understanding of marriage since the New Covenant? Has marriage changed? Has our understanding of marriage changed with the revelation in the New Testament? And number three, how can you know? How can you know if marriage is for you? What do you need to be able to accept? All right, so I'll leave you with these three questions. Have a good evening, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.